Okay, good morning. Like Rosemary said, I'm Claire, this is Riley, and today we'll be talking about complementary cartography, and we'll be analyzing National Geographic maps that play a supporting role. And so when we make infographics at National Geographic, often a lot of the space is devoted to the art. Um, the maps play a smaller role, but they're still really powerful com components because they really help provide spatial context and they can help explain geographic trends. So for example, this story, um, story about orangutans from December 2016 helps illustrate eight different orangutan behaviors. And it's really awesome because the map is really helpful and it helps explain like where they observed these eight orangutan behaviors and also where the two ranges of the orangutans are throughout Malaysia and Indonesia. And so when we bring a map and a graphic together, it can often feel like a puzzle. And so you have these two puzzle pieces and you're trying to fit them together, but if you can get it to work really nicely, it can help create a more holistic story. And so the inf infographics we create are really highly in-depth. Um, there's a lot of research, a lot of hours, and a lot of editing that go into them. Um, they're really great pieces. And so they can focus on anything from habitats and, habitats and species in the Gulf of Mexico, to the history of skis, um, to the archaeological sites and streets in London, um, to bluefin tuna migrations and anatomy of bluefins. And so some things we consider when we're bringing a map and a graphic together is when the illustration dominates the page, how do we tell a powerful story in a small map? Um, what, sorry guys. What level of insight can the map provide, and how can we create a good visual hierarchy between the map and the graphic? Thanks, Claire. So one of the awesome parts about working at Nat Geo, especially recently, is we have this really great map archive now that someone took tons of hours putting everything together. So Claire just showed some really awesome recent examples of some of these combo maps and graphics or infographics. I did a quick survey uh, through the archive to see if I could pick out some older example of these. Uh, and this, I think, is probably the oldest example I could find. It was uh, much less common uh, in the black and white era to see art and maps really closely integrated on top of each other. Um, but you can see this really interesting uh, map of the Gulf of California from 1941, where they have some cool callouts of illustrations of, of some of the wildlife there. Um, once you get to the color era, then I started to see a lot more interesting implementations. Uh, this map, or series of a bunch of small multiple maps from 1972, shows a bunch of ranges of uh, different famous animals on the African continent. Uh, and, and you see uh, a lot of times maps showing up as backgrounds uh, for showing species ranges. Uh, and in the 80s, uh, you start to see a little bit more, I would say, ambitious uh, techniques. Um, this is a really cool image of a timber rattlesnake, including its innards, and I love the way that it curves around uh, the United States, which shows its range, so you get some thematic, more detailed thematic uh, data on this map paired with the illustration. Uh, the 80s, you also start to see some new interesting styles. This is, uh, I would say, quite a contrast. You see sort of a more traditional illustration of a necropolis, and in the background, kind of a crazy Tron or War Games-like uh, map of the pyramids. Uh, and then into the 90s, uh, the way that we were integrating maps and graphics together really started to get more crazy with isometric views, um, but still some very cool styles for attempting to uh, connect these different illustrations of habitats uh, and with where they show up on the map. Um, we also started to get maybe not as successful in our book or as things that start to look a little bit outdated. Uh, this is a timeline combined with some historic globes of land masses, but with a lot of beveling and I would say not as good visual hierarchy, um, but it's still a fascinating piece. Um, same, same with uh, this world of cats, which is a really nice uh, hand-drawn illustration. Um, the map sort of falls off the background. So uh, there are a lot of different attempts to do this and it's funny, Claire mentioned um, how it's sort of a puzzle getting these all fit together. This one literally used puzzle pieces um, as a strategy to integrate maps and graphics together. This is from 2001. So that kind of takes us up to our most modern era. And Claire's going to introduce one of our colleagues who's not a cartographer, who's not here today, but has a big uh, inspiration on us and our department and sort of really influences 
our latest techniques for doing this kind of uh, map and graphic combination. Yeah, so this is Fernando Baptista. He's our senior graphic editor at Nat National Geographic, and he came in 2007, and he sort of brought this new air of aesthetics to National Geographic. He's really an expert at explaining processes and reconstructions that are hard to visualize in photos or explain in text. And he creates these really elaborate pieces. Um, for example, this is him. It's actually a paper model of himself um, painting the skyline of his hometown in Spain. And so he works in all different types of mediums, watercolor, um, clay sculpture, paper, painting, graphite, everything. And so when we're working with Fernando, um, he often has a lot of great ideas and we really try to harmonize the artwork and the map together by using consistent lighting, um, blending the colors, creating textures, and sort of making a good hierarchy between um, the map and the graphic and for the information. And so I just wanted to run you through just a quick process of a story and one that Fernando worked on. So this is one about Easter Island. And sort of in the top left is Fernando. Um, the first part is a lot of research. Um, sometimes you can work with 10 to 20 different researchers and experts on a story. Um, so this is him actually like pulling up one of the moai um, to figure out how they move them across the island um, and testing out a new theory. In the upper right is um, one of his initial sketches in Hawaii where he was um, doing some of the research and talking with people. And then in the bottom left is uh, one of the first drafts. And this is sort of when you bring in the map and you, know, you figure out where it fits nicely in the layout. And Fernando is an illustrator, so he actually painted the entire thing with acrylics. And um, because you have the map already in the first first draft, um, he could actually paint the shade of relief into, um, into his painting. And so that came together for the final piece. Um, they actually scanned it in and brought it into Photoshop and Illustrator. And they were able to overlay data on top of that hand-painted relief that he had done, add some um, additional components and different things talking about how they moved the moai and um, added some color. And this appeared in the July 2012 issue. And so Riley's going to be talking about um, one project he worked on with Fernando and some of the things he learned with it. Yeah, so uh, August uh, this year, I got the chance to work with Fernando. There's some magazines floating around. Um, that's, uh, this, this piece is from this issue. Um, so I just basically kind of wanted to give a little bit more hands-on, like detailed walkthrough of some of the decisions that were made for the maps um, in order to work them into Fernando's artwork. Um, so this was a really ambitious story about Basque whalers. Uh, the Basques were prolific whale hunters in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century. Um, they were going as far as Nova Scotia to hunt whales, and they basically dominated the market for it. Um, uh, there was a huge amount of real estate given to this piece, almost five feet of content. So even though this fits within the folded pages of the magazine, it was really almost a, the, the same amount of content as a poster or a supplement, which is something that Nat Geo is famous for, uh, with an almost higher degree of difficulty because uh, Fernando created this very uh, interesting um, walkthrough that you, that you do with the pages. So this is your first spread, uh, which is where they start out from in Pasaje, Spain. Um, you flip this over to this interesting cross-section of how the cargo hold worked, and this opens up into this amazing um, artistic rendering of how the bass actually hunted and finishes with a cool cutaway of uh, the ship and how the crew operated on it. But within all these pages, there are a bunch of graphics and we needed some uh, key strategies basically for, for trying to integrate them all together. So the three main things that we, we used on this is we had a horizontal rule, uh, we, we repeated colors for key information, and as much as possible, we tried to seamlessly blend the map colors with the artwork. So this horizontal rule is something that ran in between each of the pages. Um, and it helped us because it provided a nice consistent alignment. Um, and it was able, we were able to connect different elements in some clever ways. So here, this is a, a little image of a sailor. The horizontal rule connects with his eye line. On a different page, the rule represents the water surface. 
um, for this process diagram of how they are hunting whales. And on another page, it also serves as the water surface to show how the ship sank and what remains were found of it hundreds of years later. Uh, it also pr provided a foundation for some of the graphics that had linear information, uh, such as a timeline and, like I mentioned, this uh, hunting process that shows a step-by-step -step, uh, of how they actually hunted these whales and took them in. So because this was an early enough decision, this uh, affected even the most basic decisions that I ended up make, uh, making about putting some maps into this. Um, I tried out an equidistant azimuthal projection. I also looked at Mercator, which actually made some sense because that's one commonly used for sailing and navigation. Uh, but I ended up going with this equidistant conic, and that was mainly decided uh, in order to work with this rule. I liked the way that with its circular shape, I could uh, center the meridian on 90 degrees, which is more or less where Pasajes is, their origin. Uh, and then the map curved around and up and behind the rule, which is, I thought was a nice touch because that was the unexplored new world. Um, and it helped create more of a seamless flow to it, and I thought it had a cool look. The line also provided us some movement towards an inset map and a very tiny detail, but something I really liked is this, this little latitude tick. I was able to just align it right with the line and try to integrate it, even the most minute detail. Color is always really crucial on these maps. It's one of the things that uh, gets iterated on the most. Um, so uh, Fernando created this little uh, illustration of the whale blubber, which kind of has this weird orange color, and we ended up repeating it throughout the piece. Uh, basically to represent information that had to do with what was most important to the Basque whalers, which was getting this whale blub blubber, which is what they would process, into oil. So this showed up a lot in the graphics. Uh, wherever there were barrels in the cargo hold, hold holding oil um, for showing the spoils that were allocated to the crew, uh, and also the physical oil itself represented in how they um, took it and boiled it down into the, the product that they sold back in Europe. So this was also used in the map, in the map keys, uh, mainly to show the ranges where these whalers were operating. Um, so again, it was all about creating uh, nice connections over different parts of the page, over multiple pages, uh, with these colors that have the same meaning. Um, when you're working with Fernando, he's all about blending. So on these pages, as much as possible, we try to limit hard edges, and this includes the map. Um, most maps you'll see of his style, uh, it's very, you don't see extent uh, boxes very much. So in order to try to create some uh, seamless edges, I matched the land color uh, with the same fill of the adjacent page so that it would bleed across, used uh, fading where necessary so it would fade into the sky of the scene below. And again, that horizontal rule provided a place where I could sort of hide the information that I didn't want the reader to see behind this timeline and you sort of uh, lose track of the fact that there's a hard edge there because there's information and it seamlessly works together. Uh, one, one more example of, of this. So on this big art spread, it's this huge, amazing, artistic, hand-painted scene, um, and it has a lot of water in the foreground and a little bit of land and sky in the background. And so this locator map, which basically is illustrating where this hunting was taking place in Red Bay, Canada, uh, a nice touch that we did is we actually, for this one, the land and the watercolor from the previous map I showed were inverted, so the land was light and the water is dark. And that decision was made so that the dark water that's in the scene could really flow into Red Bay. Uh, and likewise, the land matches the land in the scene also to try to create some symmetry and essentially represent that these are in the same places and these are connected graphical elements to, to illustrate the story. So now I'll throw it back to Claire, who has an awesome example of working with a different uh, illustrator colleague of ours, and this is a very different type of graphic, uh, but again, using some of these similar strategies for getting a nice integration. Yeah, so this was a piece I got to work on with my talented colleague, Daisy Chung. Shout out to her, who's on live stream right now. Um, and this is about um, the relationship between cities and bees. Um, city beehives are actually healthier and um, doing better and more successful. They're more successful than uh, beehives in rural areas. And so scientists are taking samples from these city centers and they're analyzing the honey and they're figuring out which plants uh, bees like to forage on. And so we're illustrating the top three plants and then we're also showing these uh, six different cities and the green space that's within these cities. 
So like any project, collaboration is really key. And so we, when we were trying to figure out how we want to harmonize the artwork and the maps together, we decided to visualize the maps in a 3D perspective, um, create line work in Illustrator, and then trace over it by hand, and then also use a consistent watercolor style throughout the piece. And so one of our original ideas was to show the tree sort of growing from the land and from these cities. And we didn't really want just the map and the artwork to sit next to one another. And we also didn't want like just a locator map and pointing out where these cities were across the United States. So this was one of our original ideas. And when we brought it to our critique sessions, people were like, well, Boston, this is Boston. Boston really isn't that size to the trees and we don't want people to get confused with the scale. So we ended up taking them off the land. Um, we also tried some hex bins. We thought it would be really cool to sort of mimic this like honeycomb shape, but all of our cities are different sizes, and so it would have been really hard to illustrate that across the graphic. So we ended up going with an isometric perspective, sort of what you saw before, and this is sort of how we did it, um, doing some of these, the scaling and shearing and rotating um, to get these final renderings. So this is the, the vector line work straight from Illustrator. And all of us at Na National Geographic are really influenced by Fernando's style, and we often consult him throughout our creative process. And one thing he often does is he'll create these nice clean lines in Illustrator, and then he'll print them out, and he'll trace over them by hand or do some work in Photoshop to make it a little bit softer um, and beautiful. And so what I did was I made the Illustrator vector files, I printed them out, I gave them to Daisy, and Daisy actually traced over them in, by hand in graphite. Um, so this is what we have. And then the final thing we really wanted to work on was create this consistent watercolor style throughout the piece. Um, so we add some hue and saturation to the cities. Um, and then I also wanted to mimic um, the light green, um, beautiful artwork into the city. So adding some textures, some inner glows to the, to the green space. And then also to help blend the, the the plants with um, the cities, we added some extra watercolor texture behind. And so these were the final renderings we have just a little bit larger, but here's this for Boston, for San Francisco, for Seattle, for Portland, New York, and District of Columbia. And we just want to say thank you, and we really hope that this presentation can help inspire you guys to bring maps and artwork together. And um, have them working awesome. Yeah.